Welcome to the Big Picture Reveal Show, and today the talk is about synchronicity. And we have Michael O'Connor back to guide us in this new exploration of synchronicity. So, Michael, welcome back to the show. It's good to have you. Thank and you. we're on track today. Everything's working. Technology is uh, all lined up. Must be the moon and the stars are all cooperating. There you go. That's a good uh, intro to synchronicity right there. Uh, you know, synchronicity, that word, which means, well, uh, can be described uh, basically as meaningful coincidence. Uh, and uh, by putting the word meaningful in front of the word coincidence, we're entering into a different mindset than the normal linear material physics. I always like to differentiate now. I've come to this place where I'm going physics materiality, linearity, if you like, represents a kind of a paradigm which of itself is valid, it's just not conclusive. Uh, the mainstream scientific model plays with that as a conclusive and then the notions of metaphysical principles which include synchronicity suddenly become poo-pooed and secondary, uh, but they're actually measurable synchronicity is measurable. So it's just bad science to simply sweep it aside. Well, it's like saying that's not my religion. I don't believe that, but it's measurable. And synchronicity is exciting in that regard. Uh, and astrology is a fantastic tool to measure synchronicity. And, you know, measure it. So synchronicity is a term coined by Carl Jung the great psychologist, and uh, he himself was more or less interpreting probably a more ancient principle called uh, the law of correspondences, which is a hermetic teaching. So way back from Egypt would be the idea, and it includes seven main principles, just like today we have the seven laws of success and this and that. It has uh, mind, correspondence, vibration, polarity, rhythm, cause and effect, and gender. Those would be the seven ancient principles of the law of correspondence. So synchronicity is connected to the law of correspondence, which is itself linked to ancient mystical or metaphysical. I like to differentiate between mystical and metaphysical. Metaphysical is more like the science of... Um, mysticism it's more of an application where mysticism sort of lends this notion sometimes of unfathomably mysterious <laughs> so we don't want to get into unfathomably yeah. mysterious too much um, the science of metaphysics wants to give a science to the principle of mysticism uh, but it needs to do that from a place of a non-linearity meaning not merely physics Physics is push-pull logic where, and it's sort of a, it plays with notions that time is a dimension, which it probably isn't time. Okay, but we won't go into that. That'd be another show. Uh, what it goes into is that uh, we live in a multidimensional universe and that we're multidimensional beings. And that's the key phrase, the key understanding of the ancients, the perennial philosophy, et cetera. So one more thing. Uh, so Carl Jung, who was a student of the ancient teachings and who was a student of astrology as a, you know, he took that alternative route to understand what he was seeing and experiencing. And he decided, you know what, uh, don't tell me how I need to pursue truth. I'll find it my way and I'll be a good scientist. I'll be a good student of life and I will observe. That's what Carl Jung's integrity is largely reflected by. And then, of course, he was a voluminous writer uh, who shared his many ideas. But mostly, he coined the word synchronicity to represent the principle of the law of correspondence, which is also defined as as above, so below, as within, so without. It's kind of like a, a double axiom, as above, so below, as within, so without. And those two phrases become axiomatic for metaphysics. When you say as above, so below, 
it's the beginning of synchronicity astrologically. We see the planets and in various alignments in various times of the year. And then we see correspondences. That's what all is about. We go, oh, we notice a pattern when the planets are in this alignment, whether it's the full moon or what have you. And they, there's a correspondence in our experience here. Perfect. To physics, that shouldn't exist. No, that doesn't work. It can't, according to our model. That's why I always say, well, your model must be quite limited. When we say as within, so without, now we're starting to see a more esoteric principle yet. It's, it's you know, they're both very at par, as above, so below, as within, so without. But as within starts to talk about inner dimensionality. So dimensionality, it's a paradoxical phrase because you can think of dimensions like layers, but the paradox is it's often defined more accurately as inner layers. Uh, in physics, they, they're seeking uh, the Higgs boson or they have sought it. They didn't ever fully dis, you know, disclose whether they found it or not because what they found, I think, either confounded them or was too complex to explain. I'm not sure. But apparently they found the Higgs boson, right? But they realized almost in a hush-hush, we're almost embarrassed kind of way that there's more to it than that. <laughs> you know, like, uh, I don't really know the whole story, but the main point is that's the desire to see deeply within the material realm, which is a very valid thing on one level, on the high side of it. Others criticize that for various reasons, like it's dangerous. But on the other hand, uh, the dimensionality, the as within, shows levels of what would be in effect consciousness. What I mean by that is that we don't just simply have consciousness in this uh, metaphysical understanding of things. We literally not only live, not only have consciousness, not only live in consciousness, both being true, but we are expressions of consciousness. It's important to say that we have it, but we don't just live in it because that suggests separation. But when we understand we are expressions of consciousness, now we get into a realization of uh, what would be a divine principle. Uh, that we are, we are not only in creation, again, a separation principle is there, but we are expressions of creation, which means oneness, oneness, right? So when we get into oneness principles of existence, we are celebrating that we're getting closer and closer here to how and why synchronicity works. Okay, we uh, oneness meaning um, that there is an intimate, intrinsic relationship between the inner and the outer, the above and the below. The linear mind sees more us and them here and there. It's a spatial parts, particles study. And it's a really good study. Again, the problem is it has usurped an exclusive position on reality. That's the problem with it at worst. So we want to celebrate physics and all of the study of the deeper realms of the material dimension, but to for it to claim exclusivity on truth is a kind of theft, usurpation, lie. Um, it's a type of selective perception. It's what's it's the it's the makings of conspiracy. It's like um, who gives who the authority to decide what, you know? Um, 
it's all we've talked about this before in previous episodes the kind of the the mandate of science as the rebel who's against the authoritarian the authoritarian of the church so instead of your dogma we have our dogma <laughs> it's like okay <laughs> right so that's what it basically comes down to we're replacing your dogma with our dogma that's what at worst the staunch position of materialism physics holds so in saying that we're not dismissing physics but we're recognizing it as an aspect of consciousness it's an aspect of existence so the metaphysics here of synchronicity is that it represents like the law of attraction a constancy like a like in other words existence is like a symphony of synchronicities you know that, that we live all of existence synchronicity means meaningful coincidences all things coinciding in existence cosmically molecularly and everything in between uh as uh nasim Harriman says so well he says we are the event horizon we're the midpoint between the small and the large and i think he's really right on with that uh, brilliant uh, we are that event horizon so we're that line between the small and the large but what's woven into synchronicity can be in what the religious tradition says or refers to as the plan that like gets on purpose right uh, existence is on purpose and everything in existence functions as aspects of an ever larger whole that's what holism is about as we you know holes within holes within holes a whole cell a whole person a whole planet a whole solar system a whole galaxy a whole you know holes within holes and and so we get into this correspondence principle and um so that's synchronicity is not anomalous it represents that reality the flow of consciousness manifesting as existence that's the basic understanding existence does not come from some big bang random arbitrary moment it, it's a more of the it's a manifestation of an intentionality a plan uh, whether you're referring to the mind of nature if you like however you wish to refer to it it's it's an intelligence it has an intention a creativity a plan a design and the, and it's it's very ironic as we mentioned last time that science is kind of like well we don't like the notion that of calling it a intelligent design and it's like you got to be kidding <laughs> you know you, you got to be absolutely kidding that's all i gotta say it's like you, you did you just say what you i think you just said you are pretty bright you study complex things in nature the you're a doctorate in science you know now that you know less than you thought because now you're a doctorate now if there's one thing you learn when you know a lot is that you don't know a lot but you're telling me that you are subscribed that that nature does not have intelligence woven into it and if it does you're suggesting therefore maybe it happened arbitrarily is that what you just said it's kind of like well you gotta be kidding is all i gotta say <laughs> you gotta be kidding it's like almost like uh, like uh, as you spent a lot of time convincing yourself of this nonsense really it's nonsense to me i mean it just seems like wow that's a that's kind of like a lot of wool you're pulling over yours and everybody's eyes it just ma makes no sense <laughs> I'm not religious, really. To tell you the truth, I'm not. I, I, I honor religion. I honor whether you're a Buddhist, a Christian, Islam, whatever, right? Don't put it in my face. I honor the devotional principle. I honor that sacredness that people celebrate as religion. I'm not really that religious as such. I'm more of a spiritual scientist. The religion to me is, uh, you know, a deep sense of oneness with existence 
it's communion. It's, it's like, uh, I don't want to be hurt by you, and I'm sure you don't want to be hurt by me. <laughs> right? It's the, the golden rule, uh, right? Anyway, I'm more interested in a spirituality, if you like, a science of spirituality. That's what metaphysics is, uh, I think. That's what basically uh, holism is about. It's the science of spirituality. But spirituality need not be blubbery and emotional. Like all blindly, oh my God, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. Um, it, it, there's something to be said about rapture. There's something to be said about reverence. There's something to be said about um, all emotional, you know, feverish convictions. But we shouldn't make any one of them it, right? Uh, there is a lot to be said about using our reason, our intelligence to endeavor to define mysticism if you like, or realities that defy linear logic. So I say these things, the reason I come forth with this is because synchronicity is very much a term that belongs in the arena, at least. I don't want to say it's owned by, because it's not, let's say astrology, no, but it belongs, it, 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 it uh, resides well in that arena. We appreciate that there's a synchronicity as above, so below. You know, we see the correspondences. They happen, though, in a way the a physicist has to understand. It's not happening in the push-pull way you think it is, though. It's not happening in the linear, push-pull, mechanical way you might be assuming. This is where we get as within, so without. And this is where we get into a principle of a plan. And we, we realize that it's not merely happening as an event. It can be a, an emotion. It can, it, you know, there's a fine line between in existence. We're always in the flow of reality and events. But synchronicity is not merely showing like uh, concrete outer events. It's like flows of existence, flows of destiny. It, it shouldn't just be sort of some isolated. It's, it's a bit tricky. You have to think differently than isolated sort of events. <laughs> in other words, yeah, in man. other words, synchronicity. Maybe one of the words thinking about. Yeah. A synchronicity that it's always present. Exactly. And therefore, that above, so below, and as within, without, is the way things are. Where the separation is, is that we're so busy in whatever interpretation we have about what is or isn't that we exclude ourselves from the synchronicity that is in front of our eyes in every moment. And therefore, we think it's arbitrary. We think, oh, wow, that was out of the blue. No, it just it's just more like we showed out of the, up out of the blue by being present in the moment so that we could see the synchronicity. Exactly. The synchronicity was always there. It's exactly, that's a good, yeah, it's like the Tao. It's the flow. It's the rhythm and flow of existence. But we, in our mind, naturally want to identify things. So in a sort of an artificial sense, we kind of are isolating them and kind of, in a certain amount of sense, wanting to fixate them as something in time and space that's somewhat static, if you like, L labeled. Okay. Uh, you know, it doesn't, you know, like, of course, in, in existence, in life, there, uh, you know, everything's moving molecularly and cosmically, etc. But, you know, doesn't mean everything in the room is flying around. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's a bit of a, it's a trick. You have to appreciate that synchronicity isn't just like some magical, they show in like movies sometimes where, you know, aliens come and all of a sudden, things start flying around the room. Spielberg is good at that. He kind of wove principles of, uh, you know, um, anomalous 
activity like electricity going haywire and you know meta weaving metaphysics so at if you were i watched the movies and i i'd like to see through what i'm seeing i'm like well that's a mesmerizing bit of production but that that it's it's a nice little wonderful creative endeavor to produce an idea uh, of like oh there's some synchronistic magic happening but that's uh, a contrived illustration uh, a genius brilliant i'm not taking away from the creative genius of that i really take my hat off to it really uh it was quite clever um but it's not quite what we mean so you said it well in the flow of existence synchronicity is a constant just like the law of attraction they go well together uh, the law of attraction, which incorporates um, a, a co-creative function. Uh, and it has this quality. The law of attraction is a really wonderful movement on the high side where it's a celebration of the synchronicity, but also that we are not merely in creation. We are expressions of creation. So the law of attraction people on the high end and I'm going to say it on the high end because there's a low end in my view. But, but on the high end, it's trying to say, hey, you have co-creative power and, and energy flows where attention goes. And, you, you know, the, the basic formula of synchronicity of law of attraction is uh, no, clarify your desire, uh, focus, affirm or, or affirm, focus and visualize. You know, those are basically them. Um, when I say the high end of law of attraction, it's the principle of co-creation. The danger of the law of attraction is that it weaves into popular culture and we start to use it to attract merely and purely shallow things, which are not mm -hmm. wrong to want things, money, possessions. It's good. But I would myself say the high end is to focus uh, in, in, on what would be authentic evolutionary growth. Uh, you know, like in other words, let's not lose sight of the uh, ends while we're busy attending to the means, the means and the ends, right? Like uh, we, food, clothing, shelter are valuable necessities, but they remain means, you know, they're, they're the, the the tools of life, but they're not the end that, you know, kind of begs the question, well, if food, clothing, shelter, et cetera, is the means, what's the end? And this is where we get kind of like a, a Maslow principle of uh, the, okay, self-actualization. I think he was right. Uh, it's meaning, it, it, what he's meaning is to fulfill your destiny, you know, to, to yeah. The interesting part about that is in, in fulfilling your destiny, you can't totally fulfill your destiny without helping others fulfill theirs. So again, if you know, you're in a holistic, um, interconnectional, interdimensional world where the illusion of separation is one of the biggest challenges to overcome. So if we get caught up in that manifestation principle that somehow I can better myself by having more goodies, uh, at the expense of somebody else not getting there, so I better learn how to manifest better. This is the point where uh, we we'll all get there better if we um, manifest uh, collectively. In other words, we're making it a better world to live in. Very well said. Beautiful. Yes, it's uh, yes, the law of attraction uh, and uh, so forth. Ideally, it weaves in higher principles. You know, there's personal growth. Personal growth is overcoming uh, attachments, manipulations, uh, and addictions. Basically, we could say we could say assumptions. Okay, but I think the three are uh, attachments, addictions, manipulations. Those three. It's very human of us to rationalize by our attachments, which can manifest as our addictions, that it's okay somehow to manipulate. 
you know, where the higher word, you just said it so indirectly, is cooperate, <laughs> you know, cooperate uh, is the, and, you know, manipulation is sort of a fear-based tactic and, or, you know, we can say fear, we can go into what's fear, we can get into greed, uh, you know, it starts going down the rabbit hole, right? Uh, we won't go there, but just to say what fear is, uh, it, it's uh, covetous. And again, it's very delicate politics uh, because it's natural and wholesome to need things and to want a certain amount of space, like one's own home, right? One's own domain to be creative, to eat, to, to live, right? So, so it's uh, got a lot of validity to celebrate the material stuff of life, right? But uh, don't, you know, lose sight of the purpose, which is not, it's contrary to the whoever dies with the most toys wins kind of principle, right? <laughs> Some people, it may well be their destiny to have a lot of toys, and I'm not trying to be judging people's values, of course, you know, I really am not. Um, but the point is, uh, there comes, you said it well, uh, for it to work in its highest vibration, it invariably includes a process of contribution, right? You said. And I, I would agree with that uh, fully. It's not merely an ethical thing. It, it's a, it's more of a, uh, the way I like to think of the existence is it's more energetic. It's almost like, it's like physics that way. It's energetic, but it's energetics ultimately is consciousness. It's not, uh, you know, it's the, that's what Aquarius, uh, the symbol of Aquarius is about in its highest vibration. Uh, that all things not only have vibration, but they have consciousness. That's what Aquarius' highest message is. Uh, the glyphs, you know, everything's vibrating. But that deeper, that's where we get into the deeper root of within, is that the vibrational principle, which we can, man we can measure as, elect you know, protons, neutrons, electrons, you know, in motion, producing a vibrational frequency, but the, uh, which is again, physics, and that's fine and good, but it's deeper than that. Uh, and that's where the only way we can prove that that's there, or, or no, I shouldn't say the only way, because I'm not sure what the only way is. I don't mean that. What I mean is it, it, it explains how astrology works. I said this before, and I wanted to say it again briefly. Astrology, the planets in the solar system in the model of physics won't work because they're, the assumption is that the planets are sending some kind of special cosmic ray or some sort of cosmic energy. It's very physics. It's like, no, no. You, it's like you almost want to go, no, we got to go back to the beginning. We, you know. We have to understand that, for example, the as within means there's a plan, there's archetypal principles, there's archetypal, call them divine principles or laws that are behind the very existence of a solar system. It's not a random construct. It's not like, oh, how wonderful that it arranged itself this way. Oh, uh, then they'll go, well, the law of gravity is pretty fantastic, isn't it? And you go, yeah, that's pretty awesome. So at what point is it random? And why is it random? That's always the bottom line question. So synchronicity is a word that looks randomness, which in modern vernacular is coincidence. That's mm -hmm. the word. Coincidence is the backdoor word. That's the everyday colloquial, I, how are you? Oh, that was a coincidence f phrase of superficial, everyday chit chat, shallow. Okay, it's a coincidence, let's go. Okay, so if you wanna live at that level of consciousness, that's fine. But the deeper reality is synchronicity represents meaningful coincidence that which in other words, 
all things in existence exist by coinciding. Right? Yeah, I like the, I like I like the way you said that. Thank you. Yeah. All things are coinciding, coexisting, co manifesting <laughs> as a part of a larger process. So automatically the coinciding of all things is linked to something meaningful. And that's the whole idea is that it, there invariably is meaningfulness woven in to the otherwise what's called lower mind, everyday chit chat, kind of let's keep it simple. <laughs> you know, uh, we don't say to somebody on the street, how are you for them to go into a monologue about their existence? It's, uh, you know, fine will do. <laughs> and I'll be on my way. Um, you're, you're here, you're alive, you're, you know, you're, you're present. Okay. Uh, nice. Right. Um, if it want to go into a deeper story, you know, we're going to have to set up a different kind of situation, whether you're, you know, going to the, the coffee shop or going to the psychologist or the astrologer, if you like, <laughs> or whatever. Anyway, the point is that there's a deeper reality and co the synchronicity represents meaningful coinciding of events. And the word meaningful has to go to an all embracingness. It has to embrace. You can't start going, oh, that's kind of got meaningfulness and that kind of doesn't. Um, in our life, we make value judgments that, oh, you know, that penny on the floor is meaningless to me. Okay, kind of thing. Uh, okay, fine. You know, right. Okay. It's not, you have no, there's no reason or value for you to expend any energy to get that thing or what okay okay we got that right but it, these are just ego projections this is called you know surface consciousness you know ego projection line which is where most of us generally function it's not wrong that in everyday la 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 we're in our ego body here we are but we're not in a discussion of deeper truths or realities and we don't want to dismiss those for that surface kind of activity, right? Yeah, I, I like again what you're saying. It's a real dichotomy here in, in the synchronicity. Like you say, on one level, we can just say, well, it's arbitrary coincidence. You know, it just so happens, and uh, you know, we can sort of let it go. On the other side of the coin is that when we're fully present and alive and aligned in the moment with the whole or holistically present then the synchronicity becomes like uh, second nature it's like uh, a fish in the water and the synchronicity is now profound it means you're in the right place at the right time for the next best step it means you're in the part of the divine flow it means that you're you are moving through life with ease and grace in an effortless way. So in one level, we can throw it away as nothing, a pure coincidence. On the other, when we step into the truth of it and align ourselves like as above, so below, and as within and without, then uh, it's like we're living in a, an auto-magical world where everything uh, is pure uh, bliss because there is no effort. It's a that's the principle of the Tao, isn't it? When you're living in a flow, and there's the other words like trust and faith and attunement and all kinds of serendipity words come forward. Yes, I, I agree with that. It's uh, it's also accepting when the synchronicity is hazardous, and you know that life ha shit happens kind of thing is there too. That's where it's a little harder. Uh, you know, if we were to look at the computer screen. We're not going, oh, that's a coincidence. Oh, look at that's happening. Oh, that little thing's going across the screen. Oh, that's a, well, that's a coincidence. It's like, no, the, the, the computer functions off of an inner logic. The, everything on the screen is linked to an inner program, right? We can see that on a computer. It becomes like, duh, yeah, no kidding. Blah, you know, but we can't easily take a leap 
and say that that's happening in existence. We, we kind of have made ourselves into God. We've made ourselves into like, okay, maybe that's fine. Maybe uh, at this juncture of uh, evolution of, of human so social existence, civilization, whatever you want to call it, we're meant to uh, step into the God role, you know, to be, okay, we're now the big God, right? I mean, um, we're going to be the creators and we're going to decide what's what and we're going to control the weather and we're going to kind of decide, you know, listen up nature. Um, we've kind of, we're taking over from here. You can just sit back. We're going to take over from here. And it's like, uh, no, you're not. You're, you're going to get to a certain point of creative ingenuity on the high side. You know, let's not underestimate the genius of it. I, you know, really. Uh, but no. Um, but that's, you know, we could try our best to take it as far as we maybe. And, you know, there's something to be said about that. I don't want to underestimate that. And I think that's what I was heard. Somebody said it. I heard somebody say it the other day and I, I thought, oh, OK, I didn't hear it quite that way. They said. The age of Aquarius is the age of man replacing God. And I thought, that makes sense. Um, no, I think it, it makes sense. I think we are truly gods in potential. I mean, uh, the fact that we are trying to create uh, the world that we live in, you know, by controlling the weather and doing all sorts of crazy things uh, from a uh, what we think is a rational scientific methodology when we don't really have a clue what we're doing because we're just, uh, you know, the, the lesser of a huge gigantic number of cycles of which we're interdependent. And to think that we can step out of that and then manipulate all the other, you know, serpentitious cycles to, to work in our favor is really naive. However, if we assume the role of um, God in potentia, which means we're responsible for the whole, every bit of it. And then we have a, a, a responsibility and an obligation as an earth steward. Now we're playing a different role. Nice. Now every every action, we're responsible for the consequence of it, which is truly what we're being confronted with right now. Instead of our naivety of a little boy playing with fire that doesn't know what it's all about, if we become the being that understands what you know Prometheus and the fire gods are all about, and takes on that responsibility, we have to step into it. And I, I think that this is the age of Aquarius. You know, are we going to be the naive child on the block? Or are we going to stand, be the per, Prometheus, you know, and play with the fire and learn the consequences of that and um, become truly human, right? Yeah. Truly. Uh, yes. A God of yeah, It's, it's our a choice. You are so there. That's exactly a, a wonderful way of saying it. It's, uh, you know, I just want to qualify something. You know, when I say God, I, I'm not, it's very tricky. You have to always remind one, one has to, we have to remember we're conditioned beings. And the tendency, if you're Judeo Christian, is to have in the back of your mind a Judeo Christian image of God, which unfortunately is kind of, you know, depends on your belief exactly, but it's kind of a man and a furly browed, you know, lightning bolt thrower uh, in some respects, or it looks like Jesus or something. And it's kind of like, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about divine intelligence pervading all existence. We're talking about something more than um, we can anthropomorphize. So we want to, I just want to be clear that and I know you're there. I know you're thinking that I just for the listening audience that we're not referring to some anthropomorphic deity. We're talking about the, the, the expression of a higher power that's intelligent, intentional, creative, purposeful, loving, conscious, cooperative, those are good words. Those mm -hmm. words, though they that's what we are meant to be. All of those things. Intelligent, intentional, conscious, creative, cooperative, loving, and you said it also responsible. Right? It's it, it's right. So if we 
in this day and age, and I appreciate that about science and technology, we say, look, uh, we can create things that are, are helping us to not be at the mercy of nature, right? And that's, that's a wonderful thing. The issue is more, at, it starts to becoming political, right? About what, if just because we can, should we? Kind of politics, right? But that immediately sits right next to ethics, you know? But then if your ethics isn't bound in a deeper model of metaphysics or consideration like we're talking about, we bring forward principles of synchronicity as above, so below, as within, so without. We begin to understand a deeper principle within existence, then ethics will just become a debate of politics. It won't have it. It's like it's lost its meaning. It just becomes righteous. It becomes, yes, you will. No, you can't. You know, it's like uh, um, it, it loses its ground of true dialogue where we're really appreciating that various, uh, for example, fields of human endeavor like physics, material science, or metaphysics, on the other hand, can and do coexist. And the, and the met we have an interesting uh, question here from uh, Kenrath uh, Maharj. He says, are we responsible for synchronicity? Good question. You know, um, in a way, uh, I think what you said it earlier, uh, Tyson, so the best way I might define that is we are responsible for cooperating with synchronicity. Uh, events coincide and they have meaning so our job and you were sort of hinting at it is to uh engage in the flow of things with our humanity which includes you know reasonable simple everyday things like common sense uh and rationale and you know geez. i put per common sense in the word parentheses by the way uh, and I don't want to get caught on that tangent too much. I just want to say that we shouldn't assume what common sense is. Uh, and mm -hmm. that uh, common sense, once again, is a physics notion. Uh, in other words, I'm not so interested in common sense. I'm good. I'm more interested in good sense myself. I like to aim for, mm -hmm. you know, what I interpret. Anyway, so the answer is, are we responsible for synchronicity? I'll say the answer is yes. We in our mortality are not the source of synchronicity. We in our mortality, in our embodiment, are responsible for how we handle the, you know, the, the motions and flows of existence and how we create our own stand in it individually and collectively. You know, and we are, we're already doing that. Uh, so the answer is we are, yes, we are responsible for it in how we handle it, but as humans, we're not the source of it. it yeah, I, I, that's a great answer. Um, we're, not we're not responsible for it, for it. but the Meaning. more we become aware of it, the more it's available for us. And the more it's available for us, it's the more available for others around us. So it's a way of, um, while we're not responsible for it, when we nurture it through our awareness, if it becomes part of who we who we are in our, aware, our field of awareness, then our life takes on more ease and grace, not only for us, but for everybody else around us. And so it's sort of like, um, creating a new way of being in the world. And maybe that's what the age of Aquarius is, is, uh, you know, maybe that water element is uh, that fluid flow, that when we participate in that fluid flow, um, we get to have the benefit of it. We, we really become like the wizard in in helping create the flow and, and, re, and seeing the benefit of the return flow to us. So we're not responsible for it, but we certainly get to play with it. Uh, like just yes 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 
a comment here on the word, the the uh, the, ling the the language can get a bit tricky. What I interpreted out of what you just said there, Tyson, is we are our job is to consciously cooperate with it, right? We're dancing with it. It's the dance. Yeah. Okay, yeah, the cooperation because a dance implies and requires a conscious, deliberate, cooperative process shall we say right especially if you have two people dancing they have to deeply yes. okay but but when we say responsible i want to just be clear about something where there's a difference between a sense of responsibility to self and others versus are we the cause of it uh, like mm -hmm. it, we're talking about causality here right like uh the scientific model of causality is physics, Big Bang, and ergo everything else subsequent, right? Uh, okay. The the metaphysical notion of cause, causality, but it's really another, it's the words almost the same. It's called the causal, the cause. It, and that's a very important point to of departure here because, you know, in the, the seven... Uh, the hermetic principle the seven hermetic principles linked to the law of correspondence the first one's called the law of mind or mentality which is the notion that everything's ultimately mind uh, when we go deeply into the mind we get into what would be the divine what is actually called the causal dimension which it can be described basically as the dimension of archetypes, it's also been defined as the dimension of the mind of God. Now we get into that dangerous area of God, right? And we have to try and open ourselves past particular projections. But we get into the idea of that there is ultimately because we are it experiencing itself, but the paradox is that we're you know in duality so we're in the game of it so all from the standpoint that we're all collectively a, a part like particles of god if you want cells or features whatever um sparks all the words we're a part of it the cause uh so the differentiation is simply the difference between the cause or source of synchronicity versus the human reality of being responsible as a human being, right? So that's all I want to differentiate, clarify. Uh, yeah, well, but... yeah, it's just because the language gets a bit tricky, but in causality or the causal dimension where archetypes or the mind of God the plan, the blueprint of existence is ways of that it's been described as what Plato's all about. Uh, you know, uh, it, we would say that dimension would be the, the, the dimension from which that which we're experiences, experiencing as synchronicity emerges. It comes from that place. According to Vedic tradition, the the god source itself the source of that is even deeper within existence they say again there's a word higher versus deeper it's like saying you know like the high priest or the the pope is higher but what we really need it to, uh, uh, or a valuable consideration is no let's talk about deeper you know <laughs> like um anyway or more maybe more inclusive more inclusive is a fantastic term for that it's you know what i get from when i hear you say that is it's like the the beautiful symbol in astrology of the sun which is a you know a circle with a point in the center it's also known as the monad and it means the point in the center and the circumference around it are one and the same they it's like uh, they it's a paradox but they they're one and the same and when one studies the circle with the point in the center it actually 
can literally be a university course lasting a whole year to study that one principle because it's so richly diverse. It's such the beginning of a vastly interesting discussion. Like, for example, the nucleus is surrounded by the electron or the sun is the nucleus of the planets or the point in the center expanded represents the circle on the circumference and, and it goes on or the point in the circle in a three-dimensional image is like the light at the end of the tunnel or it's the zero point in the center of the sun or which the, is the vortex there you go. Or the zero point in the center of the sun, which is an origin point. Is that what you mean by vortex? Absolutely. It's, you know, it's the creation. It's the birth and it's the death. It's, you know, it's from, it's the point of departure and arrival, depending on which way you're coming at it, right? From the yeah. inside out or the outside in. So That's it, it really, it, it really is the point at which you, when you spin it, you end up with, um, and look at it, it's it's the yin and the yang again. You know, if, if a course like that would be better, not as a debate, but as a exercise of thinking. I think school, debates are good, but it's win-lose. What we, are, and win-lose has its place. There's lots to be said about a game where there's a, you know, an objective, but there's also um, exercising. Uh, as an end in itself. So an exercise of perception and the circle with the point in the center is, is a really good one for that. Um, your yantra symbol above your head is a perfect example and as is the flower of life symbol and as is, you know, the zodiac symbol behind me with the uh, earth in the center uh, as would be the case because uh, it's from where we experience life. So yeah, that's synchronicity. That's a good, you know, jab at it. I don't, you know, by no means have we, you know, finally defined it, but we were getting into meaningfulness and it connects itself to the law of attraction. It connects itself to a uh, principle of, of destiny, which is linked to that we live in a conscious, intelligent, intentional universe. Uh, and it, it represents that there's uh, a rhyme and reason within or behind it, or however you wish to say it, within it all. And it, it, start, it awakens, as you've been suggesting indirectly and ever so well, a divinity. And, then, and that divinity is us and we're it. So by this discussion, we're activating our divinity, aren't we? It's Absolutely. Yeah, because, we are including ourselves in the drama. Exactly. And yes, exactly. So the paradox remains, we're souls incarnate and we're in the time space dimension and we have to interact with the world in all its politics and we invariably have pleasure and pain, uh, etc. Right and wrong, good and bad, here and there, but pleasure and pain uh, and it's our teacher. Uh, so it's not, it's, cooperation is not merely an ethical thing to do. It's just the most r responsible, wise, naturally intelligent thing to do. <laughs> because the synchronistic flow of things, uh, you know, um, synch I won't go, I don't want to get off into another a whole row and round, but, but uh, when the sun is at a certain place uh, in the seasonal round, the flowers of that season come forward uh, is a nice basic way of describing it in a very, you know, concrete sort of manner. Um, it gets a bit more mystical when you start realizing that, for example, uh, the position of the moon when you were born, the phase, the aspects it's making to other planets and so forth in your astrology chart explains your emotional nature and describes how your mother was and what your relationship was and what you're carrying psychologically about that. Now that is a different level of conversation. It's measurable, it's demonstrable, 
And only a dogmatic religious mind who is afraid to investigate things from a purely truth-oriented, sincere consciousness will reject it. They will go, I'm not programmed to compute what you just said. I have been programmed to think I am seeing things objectively. Therefore, I subscribe to my program and I am very intelligent, by the way. So you must be wrong. It's like, you got to be kidding, right? <laughs> and that's what we deal with. That's what we're dealing with. And I, as an astrologer, I kind of look to myself and go, oh, my God. <laughs> um, just it's, it remains. It's, I know it comes across as, as sort of a cynicism, but it's actually kind of an expression of being flabbergasted at the lack of objectivity to one's own conditioning. You know, I have to say, there's another little thing that I just got a little pet peeve that grabbed my attention the other day. There's this guy on TED. He's really brilliant, a really good talker. Got to hand it to him. But he says, I'm a neuroscientist and, uh, you know, we study the brain and this and that. And he says, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, I went into an operating room and they put me on, under anesthesia and I woke up and I didn't know anything between the time I was put under and the time I woke up. And therefore, there's nothing else. When we die, we, it's over. I thought... I looked at it and I thought to myself, that is the most ridiculous conversation I have ever eloquently spoken, ridiculous bit of nonsense I've heard in a long time. But congratulations, you're really eloquent about it. But because you just paralleled dreaming or out of body consciousness or anything to being under anesthesia. And I was a little bit like dumbfounded. I thought, did everybody just buy that? I sure didn't. <laughs> I thought, okay, buddy. Well, you're good. That's called you. You should go to the mathematics class. You know, they make up things there too. <laughs> you know? So. Well, thank you very much for a, a wonderful discussion on synchronicity and the important role that it can and does play in our life, whether we're aware of it or not. Uh, hopefully, we all become more aware of it. Um, mm -hmm. Exciting times are upon us, like you say, with the age of Aquarius and uh, and understanding uh, the role that we get to play uh, or not play. But uh, hopefully we are waking up to the fact that we can get to play, that this is an interactive universe and that uh, it's ours to play with. That sounds pretty exciting to me. It sure does to me, too. Thanks, Tyson. That's awesome. Great synopsis there, too. So thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for being here and look forward to next time. And that's on Thursday, isn't it? It is. Same time, same place. That's Thursday. 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific time at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard. We're back on schedule. Seeing you then. And okay. So until then, have a great week, everybody. Okay. Goodbye. Everybody. Bye for now. Thanks, Tyson. Bye-bye. The Big Picture Show Revealed is sponsored by the Extraordinary Healing Arts Academy hosted by Facebook Live on the Extraordinary Healing Arts Academy Facebook page, produced by The Wellness Show, www.thewellnessshow.ca, and stay tuned, same place, same time. See you next week. Bye for now.